name. Amen. Amen. So uh, we're continuing our series. We're just in week number two. So if this is your first week, you haven't missed much. But we're in our series on Colossians, and it's called Jesus Christ in Focus. So uh, what Paul's going to talk about in this chapter, chapter two, is, you know, have you been distracted? And, you know, I think we can transfer this, we can apply this to our lives today. There's just as many or more distractions today as there were 2,000 years ago. And so what Paul offers them as potential distractions to look out for are things like this. Are you, are you distracted by people that are persuasive in their speech? I mean, Paul's big deal was he would march into a city and preach the gospel he would preach it gently, he would preach it in love, he would preach the truth, but he would be very sensitive to others and preach it in the love of Jesus Christ. And then he would leave that city and guess who would roll in right after him? There would be people who would roll in who were slick talkers, who were smooth in their speech, they were very, very persuasive, and they would say, oh yeah, 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 that Jesus thing is great, but... Oh, yeah, 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 that Jesus thing is awesome, and we're down with that, and we're cool with that. But you also need this or that. And so there were very uh, persuasive speakers, and there was empty philosophies. You know, the Greeks, I mean, what are they famous for? I mean, we're talking about a letter to Colossae. What are the Greeks, the Greek people of that day, what are they famous for? All kinds of philosophers, right? They would sit in the center of the city and they would debate things and they were there were captivated audiences who were just totally enthralled with the wisdom and the smarts and the knowledge of these philosophers who could go on and on about general concepts general concepts like love well love is just a beautiful wonderful concept that we can talk about or fate let's talk about fate for the next 17 years and then see where we get right back around in our circular arguments of what can we know apart from God. And so these empty philosophies and persuasive arguments were captivating the Colossians. But not only that, there was a Jewish influence. There was a Jewish influence that had infiltrated, and they were saying, it's great that you've heard about Jesus, but you need to be keeping the law. You need to be under the Jewish law, or at least partially because you're Gentiles, so we'll take it easy on you. Uh, but let's at least observe the Sabbath. Let's ab at least do these festivals. Now, can you see how this is still happening today? It's amazing that Paul's going to warn about these things. He's going to warn Christians, look out for people who add to Jesus Christ. Look out for people who add to the gospel. Look out for people who add the Sabbath in or add in Jewish festivals, or add the law in, or add in these other principles into Christianity. And then you just fast forward 2,000 years later, and we've still got the same issues going on. Also, he talks about religious rituals and religious experiences. He'll mention, as we're going to see, he's going to mention visions. People talk about their religious experiences, and it's great that you're a Christian, it's great that you have Jesus, but... You need to experience what I've experienced. And let me tell you about this grand vision that I had. And then everybody in the room who's hearing it, they say, well, man, I mean, I haven't had a vision yet. What's wrong with me? Right? And so we start comparing ourselves with ourselves and we end up with no understanding because we've set a measuring stick for some religious experience. And then lastly, he'll get into religious rules, which perhaps is the greatest distraction of all. I mean, you ask, you interview the average human on the street about Christianity, and something like more than 80% of, of people out there, I mean, they think Christianity is about obeying the rules. So you shove the microphone in their face, you ask them, hey, what's, what's Christianity all about? You put that microphone in their direction, and they'll tell you, it's about doing your best. It's about trying your hardest. It's about being a good Christian. It's about loving, loving, loving people. And as long as you love people, you know, that's all that God cares about. And so you've got Christians saying that, and then you've got other religions saying that. Anybody can tout love or rules as a concept, but the problem is if we're missing Jesus in it all, nothing really matters. And so... Here he opens chapter 2 and he says, I want you to know how great a struggle I've had on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea 
And for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. So first you see an apostle's heart. I mean, basically, this guy's not a, a doctrine shover. He's not just shoving doctrine in people's face. He's saying, I miss you guys. I care about you guys. I've heard about the faith that you guys have. I've heard about how you have unity among you, and I'm praying about that, and I want you guys to get along, and I want you guys to see what holds you together. I think we just saw in the last chapter that it was Christ that holds you together tightly. And if we lose focus on Christ, then everything's going to crumble. We're going to fall apart. In fact, we're going to fall apart into a thousand denominations, aren't we? We're going to fall apart into a thousand denominations if we're not knit together through Jesus Christ. And really, that's what we've seen happen throughout church history, is that we've crumbled into a number of factions, and there's been dissension, and there's all kinds of denominations. Now, next he says, I'm praying that you'll be knit together, and he says that you'll attain to all the wealth. And all the prosperity preachers go, amen, right? Attain to the wealth. See, there it is, man, in your face, right? Prosperity, prosperity. Well, all we find here really as we continue reading is Paul's talking about a different kind of wealth, of course, right? I mean, he's talking about the richness, the riches of what we have in, in Jesus Christ and what that really translates to for us on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment basis. And so he's saying that it is a beautiful thought here because he's saying there's an assurance, there's an initial assurance that we have when we come to Christ, but there's a, a full assurance that comes from what? comes from understanding the gospel in a deeper way. I mean, we are definitely in progress. We're heaven ready, but we're in progress when it comes to our understanding. I mean, my understanding 20 years ago is not the same as it is today, and it isn't, isn't the same for you either, right? So as we grow in our understanding of the gospel, we find ourselves rooted and grounded in Christ like never before. Maybe we were had a, having an understanding, a knowledge of Christianity. We had a knowledge of general doctrines and general Christianity, the movement. But over time, we figured out that Christianity offered us very little and that it was Christ that we needed to focus on. Not a movement, but a person. And so we start coming to a full understanding, and what happens from that is we get assured. So now this is the litmus test for truth, isn't it? The Bible says truth will set you free, and here we're seeing that a full understanding brings assurance, that an understanding of the gospel actually assures us. So if you're becoming more and more fearful of your salvation, if you're becoming more and more fearful of your standing with God, it sounds like you don't have a full understanding of the gospel. Because an understanding of the gospel actually brings us to a greater stability and a greater appreciation for what Christ has done. It also puts us in a rock-solid place. And so it's kind of like we have Christians on two paths. Everybody, let's say that everybody we're talking about is in Christ, but they're on two different paths. They're either falling toward grace or they're drifting away from the message of grace. And so as we drift away from the truth of God's grace toward us, we find instability, we find fear, we find insecurity, we find guilt, and we don't know what to do, and so we just try harder. And what's funny is, is that the answer is not to try harder, it's actually to change the message that we're listening to. Because if we're listening to the truth and we're gaining this understanding, then what happens is we get assured. So that's a really good test, if you're, and you should test that here. You should test that in what you read. You should test that in what you study. You should test that in what you choose to listen to. Um, you know, I'm thinking of a Christian who uh, not too long ago moved away from here and got involved in a different church and everything seemed good and everything seemed good. And then suddenly entering, entering, here it is, the fear and then the uncertainty and then the guilt. And so we get together and have a, a talk and it's like suddenly, whoa, the three things that I had bought into, suddenly I see them crumbling down and I see the truth again and it's just a big... Gosh, thank you, Lord. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. The truth sets you free and error puts you in bondage. And so the reality is, is that we can, 
We can know that we are moving in the truth of God if we're being set free by Jesus when the Son sets us free. And we also can know that we're moving in the truth of God and fixing our eyes on the right truth if we're assured in Him and because of Him. So this results in a true knowledge of God's mystery. Okay, now to the Greeks, man, that first little phrase that sounds cool, we get to know a mystery, right? Because they're all into philosophy and, and uh, worldly ideas, and they want to be smart, and they want to be right, and they want to win in a debate. And then all of that fleshy stuff kind of gets deflated with the next phrase, because the mystery is not some fact, and the mystery is not some principle. The mystery is a person. The mystery is Christ himself. So there is no grace message apart from Christ. There is no new covenant apart from the high priest of the new covenant, Jesus Christ. Doctrines will not set anybody free. When it says the truth will set you free, the next sentence says when the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And so truth is a person, and doctrine is a doorway to get to know Jesus Christ. But man, we are missing it. If we fill our heads with country club church and fill our heads with... Uh, all kinds of doctrines that we can nod our heads at and pass the test with. Man, that's fine and good, but Christ himself is the mystery that has changed the course of human history. Christ himself, a person. And so when we think of Christ himself, if we're thinking back to the historical Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's great and fine and good, but he doesn't, he doesn't impact me directly. He's a historical figure like George Washington, unless unless he comes to live inside of me. So it's not just Jesus of Nazareth, it's Jesus Christ, the living Christ, who comes to live in me, and this was the mystery. In another place, Paul says the mystery is not just Christ, the mystery is Christ in you. That's the mystery. And that's the mystery that was hidden and revealed. And so we got Christians who are looking back at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John practically exclusively in their mindset, and they're saying, look what Jesus did, I'm gonna do my best to do that. Look how Jesus loved, I'm going to try to love. Look how Jesus cared. I'm going to try to care. Well, that's right. That's right and good. But the teacher comes to live inside of us. And that's the difference. He's still doing what he used to do. He's still doing today what he's always done. The difference is he's doing it in and through us. So Christ himself is not the mystery. Christ himself in you, the resurrected Christ living inside of you right now. That's what real Christianity is. And so it says that in him, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, you can see what Paul's doing. I mean, he's trying to rope these people in. Man, you want true wisdom, Greek person? You want true knowledge, Greek person? Well, listen, you've been going after stuff and things and facts and figures and smarts, but I'm telling you that knowing Jesus Christ is the best form and the richest form of wisdom and knowledge that there is anywhere on planet Earth. And so he says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I'm absent in body, nevertheless, I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. In other words, I kind of wish I was there because I've heard that some people are getting tricked. I wish I was there in body so that I could remind you, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Are you serious? Like you're seriously going to entertain this after hearing this? Are you, are you kidding me? So I wish I was there in body, but uh, I'm not. I'm there in spirit. And so again, he's sort of saying, but I celebrate the stability that you do have. You'll notice this kind of ties into what I said last week about the mark of people that, I, people that I've known here, people that I've known that take a hold of the grace of God and just bask in it and soak in it and bathe in it. I mean, they're marked by a stability. I said that last week, that they're marked. We are marked by a stability. So when, when we get a hold of the love of Christ and when we choose to believe that we're loved and we're forgiven and we're right and we're okay and we're, we're solid, we're solid forever, that this is unshakable and unbreakable, when we get a hold of that, it brings a person to stability. And I'm not saying that it's black and white. Like... Again, we're all in an adventure of becoming more stable. A few weeks ago, I preached a message called You Torn Down or Built Up. You Torn Down or Built Up in Him. So what we're seeing, again, is more evidence that what God is doing 
is he's not tearing us down and making us more fearful of him. People talk about the fear of the Lord as if it's being scared to death of him. There's a movement. There's actually a movement right now about how we need to revere and fear the Lord. And ultimately, when you get to the bottom of the teaching, it's you need to be scared to death of God. And that that's what true reverence is or true awe is to be scared to death of him. Well, I mean, the Bible says that we, we, uh, we have God's perfect love aimed at us. And perfect love casts out fear. It says that God has not given us a spirit of fear. And then it says we can enter in and talk to God, have intimacy with dad. We can have it with boldness and confidence. And we find grace in our time of need. Now, how does that jive with being scared to death? See, there's a time when I say, God of the universe, you are creator of all, you are Lord of all, and you deserve all honor and all glory and all respect. And then I turn right around and say, and whoa, you're my daddy. You're my daddy? Are you kidding me? You're all of that, and you're my daddy. And those two fit. They're compatible. It doesn't create a a fear. It creates a reverence and an awe. And then there's also an intimacy where I get to hang out with him. Are you serious? I get to hang out with him 24-7 without interruption? Whoa. So he's saying, don't be deluded. There's a stability in your faith. Our faith in Jesus Christ makes us more stable. Another way to put it is it makes us more rooted. Another way to put it is it builds us up in him, not tearing us down. Therefore, as you received Christ... So walk in him. People say, fantastic grace message. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Love the grace message. Love the new covenant. But come on now. Now what do I do? Right? You ever find yourself there? I mean, man, I am so enthralled with the forgiveness of God. I'm so enthralled with the grace of God. I'm so amazed by the love of God. But now tell me what to do. Well, what we do is what we did at the beginning. I mean, what would you do when you got saved? You said, Lord, I can't. You can and I'm going to let you. Lord, I can't. You can. And so by faith, I believe in you, and I'm going to let you do what I can't do. Now, it's the same way when we walk. On Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday when we walk, we got Christians saying, God, look at me. Look at what I'm doing for you. Well, that's not what you did at first. When you got saved, you didn't say, God, look at me. Look at what I'm doing for you. When you got saved, you said, God, look at Jesus. Whoa, look at what he did for me. Not look at what I'm doing for you, but look at what he did for me. Now, what do we do on Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday? We wake up and we walk in the same way that we received him. We don't say, look at what I'm doing for you. We say, whoa, look at what Jesus Christ did for me. The finished work. I'm going to fix my eyes on the finished. Fix my eyes on the finished work and say, look at what he did for me. And then say, whoa, look at what he's doing through me. And so there's a looking and there's a choosing and there's a faith and it's active. Uh, We can only be looking in one place. It's not passivity. The walk is not passivity. There's a step and then another step and then another step. But we're walking in someone. We're walking with someone. They're in us and we're in them. And so it's, it's like we're keeping in rhythm. We're keeping attuned to all that Jesus Christ is in us right now. This is different than imitation. You look at a dance manual. Dance manual? I don't know. You look at a book about dancing. I mean, does anyone have a dance manual? You've got one? Okay. All right, one dance manual. That makes me feel better. But you pull out your dance manual, Jay, and and next thing you know, you know, you're looking at the moves and you're trying to imitate the dude who wrote the book, right? So you're trying to imitate the dude who wrote the book. Well, that's very different from gaining a a dance partner, dancing with the star, so to speak, where you are suddenly engaged in an actual dance with someone who's a perfect dancer. And in fact, then by some miracle, they decide that they're going to inspire and animate you from within. And all of that is so alive and so real. And yet many Christians, we've got our we got our heads buried in a, in a dance manual, so to speak. We're trying to do what Jesus did, WWJD, right? And it's not WWJD, it's WIJD. What is Jesus doing right now in and through you? Because he lives there for a reason. All right, well, we're f- firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith. 
just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So you kind of see the mark. Again, legalism is not going to do this. Law-based religion is not going to do this. Law-based religion will leave you tired and empty and frustrated and confused. And the true gospel leaves us rooted and built up in Christ and established. and, And actually, we're going, thank you, thank you, thank you. So if your Christianity is not causing you to go, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, something's wrong with your Christianity. Uh, You've got a God who's hacked off at you. He's ticked. Uh, You don't do enough for him. You never please him. He's frustrated. You're supposed to be on the mission field, but you're not, so you disappointed him. You're supposed to be up here at some level you've created, the phantom Christian, and yet you're down here somewhere in your mind. And so none of that leads to gratitude or thankfulness. It just leads to misery and confusion. So the real thing always builds you up. And so he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to the tradition of men. Let's stop there. Tradition of men. That's a big hang up. Oh, this can't be right because, you know, the early church fathers taught this. Oh, this can't be right because in the 1500s I read a piece of literature that said this. So what we start doing is we start saying that the age of a belief makes it right. The age of a belief does not make something right. It's whether it's true in the scriptures and whether the apostles intended it. Man, you can find some really old, wacky beliefs. Right? I mean, you know, where do you think a lot of these rituals came from where you buy your, for, you buy your forgiveness... Someone takes a, a, a metal container full of smoke and wafts it in your face and you buy forgiveness and now you're all good till next week. I mean, these are some really old beliefs, but doesn't make them true. It just makes them old. So we, we fall at the feet of tradition sometimes, don't we? We fall at the feet of tradition and we need to really be falling at the feet of Jesus Christ It's not about tradition. It's about, did Jesus do what he said he did? Did Jesus do what the apostles said he did? When it says your sins have been taken away once for all, is that real? No matter how old it is, is it real? And so watch out for tradition. Then he says watch out for principles. So, you know, we go to business school and we learn business principles. Uh, We go to medical school and we learn medical principles. And then we pop into church and we've got our Christian principles. You see how easy that would be. It would be easy for me to say, well, we've got business principles, medical principles, and now I'm a Christian, so I've got Christian principles. If I just live by the principles, I'm all good. Well, I mean, Paul's actually warning against worldly principles. Like anybody, a believer, unbeliever, dead spiritually, alive spiritually, anybody can create principles. It's not about a principle. It's about the person. And so, you know, I've called this series Jesus Christ in Focus because I feel like there's a dozen distractions that can easily grab us. And then there's this one simple place, this place of knowing, this place of of fixing our eyes, this place of knowing, this place of realizing, oh, yeah, it's supposed to be about him. Oh, yeah, now I remember again. Now I remember again and again and again. So he says, for in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. This is what salvation is. Salvation is not imitating Christ. Salvation is not trying to love like Jesus Christ. Salvation is not trying to act like someone who was a historical figure. Salvation is when the historical figure, when you actually decide that he is alive today, that he, he exists on this side of the grave, that he is the son of God, that he, the fullness of, of his deity uh, is in Jesus. The fullness of God's deity is found in Jesus. And in Jesus, he gets poured into your spirit Jesus Christ gets poured into your spirit. We call that the Holy Spirit, right? But in one place, Paul calls him the Spirit of Christ. So the Holy Spirit is the mechanism, is the mode by which Jesus Christ himself, the historical teacher, 
Jesus Christ himself gets poured inside of you. And then he gets sealed in there forever. So that's why we say we call it calling upon the name of the Lord. We call upon the name of the Lord and guess who shows up? The Lord. He shows up. And he cleans house and he moves in and he gets sealed up in there in the person of Christ, the Holy Spirit. And so that's how we're made complete. So salvation is not going from doing bad to doing good. Salvation is, is, is going from being dead to being alive. Salvation is not even really about rescue from a place called hell. Salvation is not, I'm going to transfer you out of hell and into heaven. There's something greater. Salvation is, I transfer you out of death and I put you in life. See, when we look at destination, we're missing the whole message, man. The message is not about a destination alone. I mean, yeah, one day there'll be this wonderful destination called heaven that we'll see physically. We'll be there physically, so to speak. But the message is for right now that we've been transferred from death to life and we've been made complete. We had a hole inside of us the size of Idaho. And now that's been filled up. I don't know why Idaho. <laughs> But Idaho is big, it's really big. It's bigger than Lubbock. But in him, you've been made complete. So he comes in, he fills, he seals, he makes whole. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Here's this Jewish guy, and, and he's using Jewish words. And you just have to realize... What he's, to him, it's a miracle. I mean, for thousands of years, there was circumcision performed with human hands on kids, right? And, and, and now he's saying, wait a minute, that was just a picture or a shadow. And really what's happened is a heart surgery that I took out your heart of stone and I gave you a new heart. And so you're compatible with me now. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So again, I, you know, I emphasize this during our Romans 6 lesson uh, recently, but just capture this now. Jesus dying for you is half of the gospel. You dying with Jesus is the other half. People are talking left, right, and center about Jesus dying for you, but you dying with Jesus is just as important, if not more. Jesus dying for you gives you forgiveness of sins. You dying with Jesus makes you new at the core. You die with Jesus, you're buried with Jesus, you're raised with Jesus. This is how the heart surgery happens. So it's really, really popular to basically make the gospel into this. Hey, did you know Jesus died for you? Yeah, it's awesome that Jesus died for you. Does it make you totally forgiven? Well, sort of, but only if you ask one by one by one. And there's the gospel. Boom. We cut out one half. We water down the other half. Jesus died for you and you're forgiven if you ask. Well, Jesus died for you. He died for all your sins. He died once. He died for your future sins. He died for the sins you haven't dreamed up yet. He died for your confessed sins, your forgotten sins. He died for all your sins once for all, taken away. The blood of Jesus Christ is enough for every sin imaginable. Now that's one half. That's good enough. We could just go home with that. It's pretty amazing. But the other half is that you died with Jesus because it wasn't about going from hell to heaven. It was about going from death to life. It was about you being in Adam with a genetic problem. You had a spiritual genetic problem. Your problem was who you were in. You were in Adam and you need to be in Christ. So he takes you, crucifies you, buries you, raise you raises you and puts you in Christ so that you're no longer dead. You're alive. Buried with him, raised with him, just as Christ was raised. Here it is. Another way to say it is verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our sins. You see the two sides of the gospel? I gave you one side and another side. Here it is in one verse. When you were dead, he made you alive and he forgave you of all your sins. Fits together perfectly. Now, having canceled out the certificate of debt, what was the certificate of debt? If I was going to write down a bunch of stuff that you owed God, 
what would I come up with? The law, 613 things that we owed God. What did he do with it? Canceled it, tore it in half, said, you don't owe this to me. It's not an IOU anymore. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when he disarmed the rulers and authorities, who were they? They were the Jews running around with the machine gun, 613 bullets inside. And they were saying, look at you, look at you, look at you. You all are falling short. Look how awesome we are and how horrible you are. And they were armed with this weapon called the law. 613 bullets inside and every single one of them hurts bad. The law kills. And so... Christ disarmed them. He fulfilled the law. He, he did what they said no one could do. And so he fulfilled the law and he fulfilled it for us and in us so that we don't ever have to fulfill it. He credited all of that to us. So they've got no ammunition left. And because they have no ammunition, ammunition left, that, that's why we see in the next phrase, he says, therefore, don't let anybody judge you. That's why he finishes this way. Don't let anybody judge you because they got no ammunition left. Everything they're going to judge you about, Christ has already fulfilled. Everything they're going to judge you about, the bottom line conclusion is, so you're not righteous. But the gospel is, you're righteous as a gift. And they've got no ammunition left. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. What does he say about these things? Man, they're just a shadow. I turn around and I look at the floor over here and the floor over here, in fact. I've got two shadows on the ground. Now, uh, I could bring people up on stage to try to have a relationship with those shadows. <laughs> I could bring cats. That would be good. I could bring cats up on the stage and they could have a heyday chasing those shadows. But those are shadows, not the reality. I'm the reality. That's just a shadow. It's it's two-dimensional, and I'm coming at you in 3D. So what he's saying is, Jesus Christ is the reality. Jesus Christ is the substance. And if you want to know the purpose of those 613 laws, they were just a shadow, a symbol of what was coming. But now that Christ has come, why are you falling at the feet of a shadow? Why are you falling at the feet and worshiping a shadow? It makes no sense at all. The substance belongs to Jesus Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize. You see how this sounds? Christianity is a prize. It's like hitting the jackpot. It's like winning the lottery. And then somebody's going to whisper to you that your ticket's no good? No, cash it in. That ticket is good. Let no one defraud you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement. They're saying, oh, don't, don't celebrate Christ. Don't let this be a happy thing. Don't let this be an exciting thing. What you need to do is beat yourself. Beat yourself down with religion like I do because God only respects this kind of humility. See, the gospel, the gospel doesn't produce men and women who are beating themselves. The gospel produces men and women who are celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ took all the beating. Jesus Christ took all the punishment so that we now are being built up, not torn down in him. The worship of the angels taking their stand on visions. You know any religions that have worshipped angels or put a focus on angels? Huh? Watch out. Taking a stand on visions. You know any denominations of Christianity or whole religions that are built on look what I saw? Out in the desert? Okay, so inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and it says not holding fast to the head. Who's the head? Christ. Real simple. Hold on to Jesus or get totally distracted by a bunch of junk. From whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, I love this, grows with a growth which is from God. So right now, here we are in West Texas, We've got floods, and then we got more floods, and then we got on top of that, we've got rain. And so, you know, people like Rex Kennedy and Curtis Thomas are out there. They're trying to grow a cotton crop, and uh, boy, God is supplying rain. As one church put it on their sign, our God reigns, right? 
there's a growth that comes from all this. It's a natural growth. It's a God-given growth. But we Christians, man, what we want to do is we want to say, I've got the market cornered on growth. I've got a fast track to growth. If I just do this and this and this, God will be pleased as punch with me. And sometimes the hardest thing to do is just say, you know what, Jesus, my growth is your problem. My growth is your problem. And so I could read the Bible five hours a day and not grow at all because I'm focused on the number of hours I'm spending. Or I could get to know a little bit of the Bible in order to get to know Jesus and grow like crazy. So am I getting to know Jesus or am I trying to grow myself somehow? Well, the growth really comes from God. We'll finish with this. He says, if you've died with Christ, remember the other half of the gospel? Look, if you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were just like anybody else, why, as if you were like a typical earthling, why... As if you were just like your next door neighbor, why do you submit yourself to rules? If I just don't handle, if I just don't taste, if I just don't touch, then God will be happy with me. Well, there were 613 of those in the Old Testament. Good luck with that approach. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish in accordance with the commandments and teachings of who? of men. Man, this looks good, smells good, sounds good. Just, it's just not good. That's the only problem with it, is it's a total deception. These are matters which have to be sure, what does it say? The appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against restraining sin. No value against fleshly indulgence. So is he just saying, let's have without religion, is that his answer? Is his message, let's live without religion? No, his answer is, let's live from God without religion. Let's live from Christ without religion. It's not some rebel message of no religion, no rules, no nothing. It's not a rebel message. It's a message that gets us stable and secure because we're looking to the one person that actually works, and that is Jesus Christ. This is not a rebel message. We're not looking to create backlash. What we're trying to do is we're trying to say there's one person that keeps us from sin. His name is not rules. His name is Jesus. So have we been distracted by persuasive arguments? Are we distracted by empty philosophies? Are we distracted by religious traditions? How old something is, religious rituals, religious experiences like visions, or maybe even religious rules that sound so right. Well, he's saying let's keep Jesus Christ in full focus. Let's pray together. Father, we, uh, we thank you for the first half of the cross. There may be people who've said, you know, I, I knew about Jesus dying on the cross. I knew that he died for my sins. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. But there's another half here. And maybe there's somebody here who's never said, you know what? Just in case this thing is real, just in case this thing is as awesome as I think it is, just in case this miracle can actually happen, I am inviting the life of Christ to come in me. I, I believe that I'm dead and I want to be alive. Father, for most of us, we've invited you in and you've made us alive. You crucified us, you buried us, you raised us, and then we go on living like any old person. And it seems like what you're saying to us, Father, is that uh, because we've changed, the way has changed. Because we've been changed at the core, now the method has changed. And the method is the same as the way you transformed us. Looking back to you look into Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for making us alive. We thank you for forgiving our sins. We thank you for reminding us that it's all about a person, Jesus Christ, in focus. In his name we pray it. Amen. You guys stand with us.
were two people back in a garden. They had no Bible. They had no church building. They had life. They had life in God. 2,000 years ago, the early church ran around. They had no Bible. They were lucky to have one letter. Some of them couldn't read. Some 70, 80% of them were illiterate. What they had was life from God in the person of Jesus Christ. In the garden, life was had. In the garden, life was lost. At Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came to live inside of them, life was regained. The Bible is a story of life, life lost, life regained. It's beautiful that we went through 20-some verses today. Without the Word of God, we'd be up a real creek. I celebrate the Bible. I celebrate the Word of God. There's a greater message. Before there was any Bible, there was the living Word. Before there was any Bible, there was the living truth, the truth of God living in humans. Jesus Christ, the truth, the word lives in you. Don't let him be quenched and stifled. Don't let him grieve over your choices. Instead, allow the voice of Jesus Christ to rule. Allow the voice of Jesus Christ to inspire, to motivate you. He lives within so that he can live through and live throughout every aspect of our lives. Have a great day.